All right. Is this okay? I need to remove this. Okay. This is good. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Good morning and happy Sabbath to those that are going to join us that are worshiping today. So we continue in the Songs of Songs study. And what we're doing in this study today is that we're looking at the God's hair. We're looking at, he is describing the hair of this woman. And it's one of the most interesting studies for me. We are not going to dwell on so many verses from the Songs of Songs, but we're going to get one phrase from the Songs of Songs. And out of that phrase, we're actually going to get the study for today. So my prayer is that God will help us through as we go through. Uh, I'm going to be as slow as possible so people may actually catch up as well. I can see that there's only about 201 people watching. Okay, so you can say good morning. You can comment as the study will be going on as we start our study for today. Uh, looking at your hair is as God's hair or the God's hair. Now, people talk about God, being a God, being all this, the greatest of all time. But in this study, what we're going to discover is that the greatest of all time, even outside time, is Jesus. And that, that's the one that we're going to discover through the God's hair that is in the study today. So we're picking up from Songs of Songs, chapter 6, verse 5. In Songs of Songs, chapter 6, verse 5, listen to what it says. We did the first part of the study in last week's study. Good morning, uh, Kawam, Kawam. Hi, brother. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. Thank you for following. So we're going to do the second part of the Songs of Songs study uh, Songs of Songs, chapter 6, verse 5, we did the first part, which we talks about, Turn thine eyes away from me, for they have overcome me. So if you didn't watch the other study, or you didn't uh, listen to it, I'll ask you to go back and check on my wall. It's actually there. Or you can go to the YouTube channel, which is uh, A Voice, A Cry. So it says, Turn thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. We discovered what that means from the scriptures. We really labor to see what that means from the scriptures. So today we're going to look at the second part, which says, Your hair or thine hair is as flock of gods that appear from Gilead. So he's describing, he is the one now that is describing the hair of this Shulamite woman. He says, your hair is as flock of gods, these black gods that appear from the Mount of Gilead. Okay. Now, another verse that gives us that phrase, uh, the hair is as flock of gods, is in Songs of Songs, chapter 4, this one. Listen to the verse. It says, behold, thou art fair, my love, behold, thou art fair, thy Thou art dove's eyes within thy locks. That's another study on its own. So the locks that are on our head. Remember, he has the locks. He is the Nazarene. He has this long hair, which is a picture of his strength. And, and we looked at that when we talked about... Um, when we talked about Samson as a Nazarene, and Jesus Christ was actually Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He was a Nazarene as well. So it says, Thine hair is as flock of gods that appear from Mount Gilead. That's the same thing that we're measuring, we're seeing there. It says, Your hair is as mount is as a flock of gods that appear from the Mount of Gilead. Now, hair, flock of gods, hair flock of gods is going to be the very essence of our study today. It's an interesting study in that we're going to see what does it mean when, she, when it says she's got this hair that is as flock of gods. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about hair and its symbolism. Uh, so let's go and look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15, when we read uh, John. In John 12, there's three. So let's start with 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15. We're just laying the foundation of the study because we're going to look at the hair of these gods, this flock of gods. Our hair is as flock of gods. So it says, but if a woman has long hair, it is glory to her. So hair is a representation of this glory that a woman has. It says, for her hair is given for a covering. So hair is supposed to cover her. It is a symbol of her glory, where she glories in. In John, <clears throat> if you go to the book of John chapter 12, verse 3, it says, And took Mary a, 
a pound of ornament of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. So when Mary broke the alabaster box, she started anointing his feet and wiping his feet with her hair. She was using her hair to wipe the feet of Jesus. And that's the picture of uh, getting her glory and putting it in the dust at the feet of Jesus. You begin to see how these things actually form together. And the house was filled with the odor of the ornament that she broke there. So hair, if you go back to the story of Samson, Samson's strength was in the hair. So if you look at this part, so we're saying that strength, glory, hair is a representation of those two things. There's strength, there is glory to read from the verses that we just read, even from the story of Samson. So when you look at Mary, what is she doing with her glory? is that in a nutshell, she's getting her glory and casting it to the feet of Jesus in the dust. And we know that righteousness by faith is laying the glory of man into the dust. So we're seeing the same picture. If the church has to be true worshipers, we have to get our glory and cast it to the ground and lift up the only one glory that we need to, and that's the glory of Jesus himself. Fear God and give him glory is the message. It's part of the message of the three angels message. It is part of the everlasting gospel that there is this fear of God. So as we talk about our hair is as God's hair, what does this mean? How does this come into play the time that we are living in today? So we just seen all those examples. Of, now let's go to the verse. It says, thine hair is as flock of gods that appear from Gilead. Now, we have to talk about Gilead before we talk about the hair. So these uh, gods, it's a picture that is given of gods that are appearing from the Mount of Gilead. And we'll see the context of in which we're living in, uh, in the context of the Day of Atonement. Now, we, we've been talking about the Day of Atonement. For those that don't understand the Day of Atonement, it's the time in which the high priest enters the most holy place and begins to intercede for his people. That's the day of atonement. It's a day of one man. It's a day in which the high priest only once in a year would enter into the most holy place and begins to minister and intercede for his people. So in the context of the day of atonement, sanctuary picture, temple sanctuary that we are given in the scriptures, what are we seeing as of great significance to us in relation to the God's hair? We have to discover that today as we go through the study. As we are living today, 2021, what is the significance of the day of atonement in connection to the God's hair? Let's go to the... Before we go to the book of Exodus, I think I want to spend some time before we go to Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 26, I want to talk about Gilead. Remember, the verse says that thy hair is as flock of goats that appear from Gilead. Now, Gilead is a place in the Bible. The first time that we encounter Gilead in the Bible is when Jacob is running away from his uncle. He's gotten all his goods, he's gotten all his wife and his children, and they are moving away from, from his uncle. They moved, I think it was by night. And then when Laban, the uncle, Laban, which means white, heard that uh, Jacob actually left, he followed on with his, uh, his, his, his men to follow Jacob. So Jacob, as he's moving, going to meet, going back to his, his, his homeland, he runs away from Jacob, from, from, from Laban, and that Laban begins to chase after him. And as Laban is chasing after Jacob, God appears in a dream to Laban, is that do not do any harm to Jacob, neither should you do any good to him. So when they have this conversation, they talk about that and they, they reconcile. There was a reconciliation picture that we're given when they met and they had this covenant reality that there was no more enmity between the two of them, that they were at peace between the two of them. So that reconciliation, when it happened, they had elected two pillars of stones. Now I'm talking about Gilead, two 
two powers of stones. And those two powers of stones, it's where the word Gilead comes from. That's where Gilead is. So that place was named Gilead where they covenanted together. Meaning that two things are being, are coming into union there's this union there's this reconciliation there is no more hostility between Laban and Jacob the reason why I'm emphasizing on that is because you see how these gods that are appearing from this flock of gods that are appearing from Gilead are very important to the study I hope you got that uh, introduction to Gilead but now let's go to Exodus in the context of the day of atonement that we are living in the sanctuary picture. What are we seeing is of great significance to us in the times that we're living in. In Exodus chapter 26, we'll read verse uh, 7 to 13. And let's begin to see this God's hair. The hair of the God, because he's describing this woman as having hair of a God. Like your, your hair is a flock of gods from the Mount of Gilead. Listen to what it says. It says in Exodus chapter 26, verse 7, it says, Then shall you make the exterior or the outside curtains of God's hair as they tend to cover over the tabernacle. So there was a curtain that was to be made of God's hair on the outside that covered the tabernacle. And you shall make 11 curtains in all. So there were 11 curtains, 11 curtains that were representing this God's hair tent that covered the tabernacle. Listen to what it says in Exodus. We, we're still in the book of Exodus, but let's go to Exodus. We just read Exodus chapter 26, verse 7, but I want us to go to Exodus chapter 35, verse 25. Listen to what it says, because all the people that were involved in the making or the displaying of this sanctuary, they were given wisdom from God. And let's see who are, who are handling this God's hair in the tents when it was being made as a, as a curtain to cover the sanctuary. Let's go to Exodus. Exodus 25, verse 25, it says, And all the women, the women that were wise in heart did spin with their hands and brought that which they spun so they were spinning with their hands they were moving things together they were twisting things together and brought those things which they spun of blue of paper of scarlet and of fine linen now we know that in the sanctuary structure these are all found there there's blue there's paper there's there's fine linen so exodus chapter 35 verse 26 it says and all the women whose heart were steered up in them in wisdom to steer up is to twist up Something twisted up. They all the women that whose heart was still them in, in wisdom, they twisted together or they spun together the God's hair. And it was these women that spun together or twisted together the God's hair that made these tents, which were eleven, to cover up the sanctuary picture. Exodus 28. Let's go to Exodus 28. Another verse, just telling us more on this uh, God's hair. Exodus 28 verse 3 says, And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, who are filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they shall make Aaron's garments concentrated to him, and, they, and he shall minister unto me in the priest's office. So God had to put wisdom for these people to participate in the making of the sanctuary itself. So the sanctuary needed to have a covering, and that covering, which was outside, made of the 11 curtains, it was the women that were filled with the Spirit. That is essential. The women that were filled with the Spirit of wisdom to learn how to interwoven and, and put things together and form this tapestry that covered the sanctuary itself. It was God's Spirit that filled them. We just read the verse. So the women were filled with wisdom by the spirit to span or to twist together the God's hair and form this fabric of 11 curtains that covered the outside tapestry of the sanctuary. That is essential. Now, it was the women that were filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's look at another verse in the Bible. 
and let's connect with these women that are filled with the Holy Spirit to do a certain work. In Luke chapter 1, let's go to the book of Luke chapter 1, verse 35. In Luke chapter 1, verse 35, it says, And the angel answered and said unto her, This is the angel Gabriel that comes to Mary. Now, remember, the women filled with the Spirit. And they did span and twist together and form this fabric. Now, in Luke chapter 1, verse 35, we're told that the angel, who is Gabriel, answered and said unto her, Mary, Mary the virgin. It says, And the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. Therefore, that holy thing which shall be born out of thee shall be called the Son of God. We just read of the women in the Old Testament that spun together and twisted together and formed this fabric that covered the sanctuary itself. And we just saw another woman from Luke chapter 1, verse 35, who is Mary, who is overshadowed with the Holy Spirit, and she's going to twist and give birth to this holy thing which shall be called the Son of God. Two things that you need to put together. Let's look at Jeremiah 31. In Jeremiah 31, verse 22, it says, How long will thou go about, O thou backsliding daughter? For the Lord has created, God has created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall encompass or shall give birth or shall twist with a man child, shall give birth to a man child. That's the prophecy which is given of the birth of Jesus. So, so far, what are we seeing? We're seeing that it was a woman that was filled with the Holy Spirit that gave birth to Jesus. That holy thing shall be called the Son of God. And here in the prophecy in Jeremiah 30, 31 verse 22, we're told that, that God is going to create a new thing. It was a new thing altogether when Jesus Christ was born. And how are we connecting this with the tents? We're seeing that the women were filled with the Spirit and they were able to twist together the God's hair that formed this tapestry that covered the sanctuary itself. And that God's hair tent, remember it says, we read that it had 11 11 curtains that were put together. And we'll see from the verses that we're going to read. I'm just giving away the overall of the study. Is that these 11 curtains that were put together by these women that were filled with the Holy Spirit is the same representation. It is symbolic language for the nature of Jesus, the humanity of Jesus that will be born, that was born through a woman who was filled with the Spirit. And that is Mary herself. So the question is... Where did these women get this God's hair that they spun and twisted together to form this fabric that covered the tabernacle itself? Where did they get these God's hair? Where did it come from? Because we need to put things together for us to see the true picture that the Bible gives us. So let's go to our verse. Okay, let's go back to uh, Exodus chapter 26. Exodus chapter 26, verse 7, he says, And then you shall make the exterior, the outside curtains of God's hair as a tent covering the tabernacle. So the exterior part, God's hair covering the tabernacle. And you shall make 11 in all. So there were 11 of them. Mark that. The number is very important. So it was the God's hair, that's where they got them. But let's look at the God itself, the God's hair, when it comes to the sacrifices that are presented in the scriptures. How does the God sacrifice come in when a God is being sacrificed? Remember, we're talking about the greatest of all, and that is Jesus. So let's go to the book of Leviticus chapter Leviticus chapter 16, verse 5, let's look at this kid of the God, because for a sacrifice to be offered, they had to get a kid of the God, the young of the God. In Leviticus 16, let's look at all these verses that talks about the sacrifice of the God. 
And let's look at what type of sacrifice is being mentioned here because there were types of sacrifices that were offered. We had the sin offering, we had the, the grain offering, we had the whole bent offering, we had all different kinds of offerings with the meal offering, the peace offering, the all this, the transgress offering, the guilty offering, all these difference. But when the God was being sacrificed, what kind of sacrifice was it? And how significant is that sacrifice to the day of atonement, the time in which we're living in when Jesus Christ is in the most holy place? How significant is the sacrifice of the God? Because it was through the sacrifice of the God that they got the God's hair and formed this fabric that covered the sanctuary itself. So in Leviticus chapter 16 verse 5, it tells us this, it says, And ye shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel, two kids of goats for a sin offering. So when a goat was being sacrificed, it wasn't a bent offering, but it was a sin offering. And one ram for a bent offering. A ram was for a bent offering. A goat was for the sin offering. I hope you're seeing the two dimensions that are presented there. In Numbers chapter 7, there's 80, uh, this 87, it says, and all it says, and all the oxen of the burnt offerings were 12 bullocks, and the, and the rams were 12, and the lamb of the first year were 12, and their meat offering, and the kid of the gods of for sin offering were 12. So they're giving us all these numbers that were being sacrificed by these princes, if you look at the context of Numbers chapter 7. But it tells us that the kids of the god, the kids of the god, were for sin offering. So whenever a god was being sacrificed, it was for a sin offering. It wasn't for a burnt offering. It wasn't for a peace offering or a meal offering or any other offering, but it was for a sin offering. Please understand that. So in the context of the Day of Atonement, the time in which we're living in, the time in which Jesus Christ is interceding in the most holy place, in the context of that, the only animal that was used for a sin offering on the Day of, At of Atonement is the God. Not the bent offering, but I'm talking about the sin offering. It was the God that was offered. The only animal accepted on the day of atonement. The only animal accepted. There's a reason why I'm repeating myself. The only animal accepted on the day of atonement for a sin offering. I emphasize sin offering was a God. And you see why that is significant as we go through this study. Now remember that we are studying about this because the beloved Solomon himself, Shalom himself, has told the woman that her hair is a constant reminder to him of the flocks of gods that appeared on Gilead. And we just saw what Gilead has to do. It has to do with reconciliation. It's a mount of reconciliation and all that. It's a mount of healing, of wholeness. That's Gilead, a balm in Gilead. You see all these verses as we go into this study. So to the woman, her hair was a constant reminder when they're having this face-to-face -face interaction. When he looks upon her hair, it was a constant reminder of that sin offering of the God that was offered. Example of the sin offering. Let's look at the Bible. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 4, verse 23. In Leviticus chapter, chapter 4, verse 23, it says, it says, of, of if he sinned, this is talking about a ruler, if a ruler has sinned, wherein he has sinned and comes to his knowledge, he shall bring he shall bring his offering, a kid of the God, a male without blemish. So without any blemish on the outside and on the inside, this individual ruler or sinner was to bring a kid of the God, a male without any blemish. That's an emphasis of the nature which Christ had. It was a nature without any sin. Jesus Christ is the only one that said, the devil has come 
and has found nothing in me. There was nothing of condemnation in him. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 24, and it says, And he shall lay his hand upon the head of the goat and kill it in the place where they kill the burnt offering before the Lord. It is a sin offering. So when the goat was being killed, it wasn't a burnt offering. It was being killed in the same place where the burnt offering was being killed, but it was a sin offering. The burnt offering and the sin offering are two different offerings. We're talking about the sin offering of the God that was offered. In verse 25, it says in Leviticus chapter 4, it says, And the priest shall take the blood of the sin offering with his finger, and he shall put it upon the horns of the altar on the burnt offering, and shall pour out his blood at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering. So when this sin offering was being offered, they take the blood and then they smear the blood on the four corners of the altar of the burnt offering. Then the rest of the blood was being poured out. Remember we are told in, 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 uh, in uh, Isaiah 53 that Jesus Christ poured out his soul for the sins of many. It was a pouring out of his soul for the sins of many. Leviticus chapter, chapter 9. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 9. Leviticus chapter 4. Let's still read Leviticus chapter 4, verse 26, which is the last verse in Leviticus chapter 4. It says, And you shall burn, and you shall burn all his fat on the altar, has the fats of the sacrifice of peace. Has the fat of the sacrifice of peace. And the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin, and it shall be forgiven for him. So already, this is the meticulous, the meticulous instructions that have been given for the sin offering and what's going to happen to it. It's going to be bent with the fat on the altar, and then that fat is has the fat of the sacrifice that gives us peace. When you have peace, you have reconciliation. So this is all one and the same thing that we're talking about. And to make an atonement for him as concerning his sin, and it shall be forgiven him. In Leviticus chapter 9, verse 3, it says, And unto thy children, we're still looking at the sin, the God being sacrificed for a sin offering. It says, Unto the children of Israel, thou shalt speak, say, Take ye a kid of the gods for a sin offering. So whenever a kid of the God was being sacrificed, it was always for a sin offering. And the calf and the lamb, both of the first year, without blemish, for a burnt offering. The burnt offering was for a calf and the lamb. The sin offering was for the kid of the God. The distinctions are very important. God is being specific for a purpose. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 19, it says... And ye shall sacrifice one kid of the God for a sin offering, and two lambs of the first year of the sacrifice for a peace offering. So the lambs, peace offering. Sin offering, the God. Numbers, again, let's go to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 7, verse 16. It says, one kid of the gods for a sin offering. God keeps on emphasizing. These are different verses. God is saying the same thing. If lightning strikes a place twice, maybe you need to pay attention. But if it strikes a place five, six, seven, eight times, maybe we need to build on that place. Maybe there's something that God wants us to understand about this sin offering. The God a sin offering, the God, the sin offering. God keeps on repeating himself in all these verses. Number 16, verse 24. And it shall be that if you ought to, you ought to commit, it says, and it shall be, if ought be committed by ignorance without the knowledge of the congregation. If a sin is done in ignorance without the knowledge of congregation, now we're going to categorize the sin offering without the knowledge of the congregation and that the that all the congregation shall offer one young burrock or ox for a burnt offering for a sweet savor unto the Lord. That one burrock, which is an ox, is a representation of Jesus Christ himself, who is a sweet savor unto the Lord. This is the red heifer, and I think we're going to do the next study, which is going to be a pause on Songs of Songs. We'll look at the red heifer 
a sacrifice, which is beautiful sacrifice in itself. But today we're talking about the God. It says, For a sweet savor unto the Lord, with his meat offering and his drink offering according to that manner, and one kid of the God for a sin offering. There you go. Kid of the God, sin offering. Burok, a sweet savor unto the Lord, bent offering. Now, on the day of atonement, this happened. We just looked at the God sacrifice and how the God is a representation of that sacrifice for the sin offering. And we talked about the hair of the God and the covering of the, of the sanctuary. This is where they were getting this hair that they were making, this tapestry that covered the outside of the sanctuary. Now, on the Day of Atonement, why are we emphasizing on the Day of Atonement? Because we're living in that time. So we need to go back and ask God to show us what is the reality of what's going on today. When it comes to salvation, the salvific picture that we need to get from the scriptures to see where Jesus Christ is. Because if we do not have the right comprehension, the right knowledge of what's going on in the most holy place in the salvation work of Jesus, we'll end up not aligning with him. And if we are out of line with him, it's easy for us to apostatize. It's easy for us not to have to exercise the right kind of faith during the time that we're living in. Because during the time that we're living, God requires that we align ourselves with the head. On the Day of Atonement, this is what happens. Let's go to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 16. We're going to read verse 5 through to 10. Listen to what it says. And you shall take, you shall take up the congregation of the children of Israel, two kids of the God for sin offering. So two kids of the God were gotten for a sin offering on the day of atonement and one lamb for a burnt offering. Two sacrifices were being offered. One for a burnt offering, one for a sin offering. On the day of atonement, it was two kids got, two gods for a sin offering. And he shall take that two gods and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle for the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. So they're going to be two gods. They're all claiming to be the greatest of all time. They're all claiming to be rulers. They are two gods. One God is for the Lord. The other is for the scapegoat or the Azazel. So when this other God is for the Lord, it talks about his, pers his personality. It's the Lord Yahweh himself, the self-existent God. The other one is on the opposite structure, which is the Azazel, the one who is contrary to the character of God, and that's the devil. But these two gods are presented for a sin offering. Remember, they're all claiming to be the greatest of all time. The question is, which spirit is going to rule in the world? Is it the spirit of the God of the Lord, or is it the spirit, the God of this world? The world, the wilderness in which we're in, the God that was taken to the wilderness, the dry place. Who is going to rule? We need to look at these two gods. Because it's very essential to the time that we're living in. Who rules? And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two gods, one for the lot of the Lord and the other for the lot of the scapegoat. And Aaron, in verse 9, it says in Leviticus chapter 16, they said, And Aaron shall bring the God upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. Now, without the shedding of blood, there is no remissions of sin. So the one God where the Lord fell, that God was to be offered for a sin offering. There was a sacrifice to be done. Verse 10, it says, but the God on which the Lord fell to be the scapegoat shall present alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him, not for him, but with him. 
and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. So the two realities come into play. There's the one scapegoat, and then there's the God for the Lord, who is offered for the sin offering. So the sin offering did not defile. So when the sin offering was offered, the sin offering was there to purify or to cleanse. The blood of the sin offering, the God that was killed, the God of the Lord, is there to cleanse. There's only one blood that cleanses. All the bloods of bulls and gods and all these could not cleanse the karma or the worshiper to set them free from the conscience of sin. But the blood of Jesus, the one God of the Lord, is the one that cleanses and purifies. The difference is that when that scapegoat was taken to by the feet man who took it to the wilderness, that man was defiled by it. But that God which was for the Lord did not defile. But that man who took had to come back and wash and cleanse and go through these rituals in order for him to be cleansed of that scapegoat where the sins of Israel were placed. God's people. Eventually, God is, has to get the sins of his people, which they have for, participated in and have confessed sins. He has to get those sins and put them back on the scapegoat. The difference is that what cleanses us is the God's law. It's the, it's, it's, the, it's the God of the Lord on whose the Lord's fell for the Lord. The one who is sacrificed for a sin offering. Through the shedding of his blood, his blood makes atonement. His blood makes reconciliation. His blood brings us to Gilead where we can be reconciled in the mountain of the Lord. Where we can be healed. There is a balm in Gilead. His blood is that balm that heals and unites us. His justification, what he did for us, his sacrifice for us, is what heals and puts us back together with him in harmony. So his blood, the blood of the sins offering did not defile, they only cleanse and they purify. Let's see this reality from the book of uh, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10. It says, for the life of the animal is in the blood and i have given it for you to, upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes atonement for souls it's the blood that has power consistently the blood of jesus never loses its power it's the one that makes atonement for our souls in the New Testament, we are taught by Paul in, 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 in Hebrews that it's, it's not the blood of gods or, or, or all these things that were sacrificed that cleansed the karma's conscious, but it was the blood of the one sacrifice that was offered that cleansed and makes atonement for us. His blood. If God was to get our blood, because the Lord demands blood, blood demands blood. It took the blood of the infinite one to take away. You see from the tapestry, from that tent itself, how these, these curtains are bringing the reality of what happened in the body of Jesus. You see as we go into this study. So what we are seeing is that the God of the Lord and all the other gods that were sacrificed contributed to these 11 curtains that were used of the God's hair that covered the sanctuary to make the curtains to cover the outside of the temple. They contributed. That's why they got all these things and the women would twist and make these beautiful fabrics that actually covered the sanctuary itself. Let's go to verse 8 of Exodus chapter, chapter 26, verse 18 says, Continuing, we, did, we dealt with verse 7. Let's go to verse 8. It says, each curtain, that word curtain is to tremble. The curtain trembles, moves like this. The curtains, when there's the wind, it moves, it trembles. It says, each curtain shall be 30 cubits long 
and four cubics wide. A cubic is this, from here to here, from the palm to the elbow. So 30 of them, 30 cubics long. And the each curtain shall be of 30 cubics long and four cubics wide, or the breadth of it. The 11 curtains shall all measure the same. So there's this emphasis of the measurements of the 11 curtains. They shall all measure the same. They are 30 cubics long, and then in breadth, they are four cubics. Verse 9, it says, and you shall join five. Remember, they are, they are 11. You shall join five of them, join them together, the five of them, when you join, and the other six by themselves. So five and six have been separated. There is a reason why. There is a divine reason why God says five, and then he says six. <laughs> says, and you shall double over the sixth ketan at the front of the tent to make a closed door. Hope you understand this. So God says you shall have 11 ketans, they are of the same measure, and then you shall get five, and you shall get six, and then the one that connects them, the one that's going to make the door, the sixth ketan, you shall double over. you see the double reality as we go into the study. So the 11 ketans of God's hair together, five of them and six of them were brought together and knitted together. Why five and why six together? We have already seen that God's consistently uh, required the children of Israel to make an atonement for the sin offering, the sin offering, the sin offering, all those verses that we saw that. Now, be, at the beginning of the year, for example, at the beginning of the year, where they had the Passover, when they had the new moon and all that, it was the Passover time. And during that Passover time, they were required to make a sin offering. That was at the beginning of the year. So during all the feasts in all throughout the year at different feasts, a sin offering was made corporately and individually. Corporately as a congregation and individually as a sinner. When you've done something, uh, you've sinned out of ignorance. And you see that the sin of ignorance is a sin of Calvary. Because and, uh, Jesus Christ, when he's dying on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. That's the sin of ignorance. And that's what the sin offering, the God sacrifice covered. It covered the not knowing the sin of Calvary. Our, our dear sign, our killing of God on the cross of Calvary. Unbeknown unto us that we did that. Now we think not knowing or ignorance is equated to innocence. Ignorance is not equated to innocence. By the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and the sacrifices that were made in the Old Testament, that should already tell us that ignorance is not blissful. Just because by default we are sons of the devil does not make us innocent. Just because by default we follow through with the things of the devil, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, does not make us innocent does not make us innocent. So we need to understand that the sin of ignorance is huge because it's the sin of Calvary. It's the sin of Calvary. And that's what the sin of the sacrifice of the God covered. It covered the sin of Calvary. The sin that we became sinners through the act of one person, and that's Adam. And through the act of another Adam, we are justified. So just because, well, I, I didn't do anything. We, we don't need to be like Cain. Most of us are like Cain. Because Cain did not see the need of offering that sacrifice on the altar. That pointed to us as sinners. The sin offering. He did not see the need of that. He offered only the thanksgiving. I'm okay. I didn't do anything. I don't think Cain did anything bad and all that. But that was a constant reminder by God saying, listen. You are a sinner by nature, and you need to offer this. But I, I'm okay, I don't know, I don't know. The fact that you don't know, it's a sin of ignorance. And the sin of ignorance carries culpability. The cross should tell us that what happened to Jesus on the cross of Calvary should be a typical example of how God deals with the sin of ignorance. That's how we do. What happened? The justice of God that was fulfilled on the cross is a constant reminder that 
There is no, there's nothing uh, petty about the sin of ignorance. But sometimes we choose as human beings to be ignorant, willful ignorance. Just, I don't want to know, I don't want to know, I don't want to know, I don't know. And we think we're innocent just because we don't know. Nah, culpability comes, my friend. So we've already seen that, that throughout all the year, all the different uh, sacrifices, the sin offering was made corporately and it was made individually as a sin offering as well because they constantly, the sin offering was a constant reminder that we are sinners. It was a thorn in the flesh that we have this sinful body, which is a constant reminder that we are warped, corrupted, it was a thorn in the flesh that was a constant reminder that we are sinners. So they had to carry out these things corporately and they had to do this individually. So for individuals that brought the sin offerings in the gods that were the gods that were used for sacrifices, it was five. Five times the gods were used for sacrifices. And then corporately it was six. Look at the feasts that were there. There's a chart for it. Okay, where the corporately they offered the goat in those at the beginning of the Passover, going into the unleavened bread, the Feast of Weeks, the, up to the time when it comes to the tabernacle, it was six times that it was offered. So you have five and you have six on the other hand. That's the ketan that made up the covering of the sanctuary. In that ketan, God was being specific. Get five and get six. And when you get six, and if you look at the corporate ones that were done, which were six, there was one on the Day of Atonement that was significant. Because that sacrifice that was made on the Day of Atonement was different in that it was the God of the Lord, where the Lord's Lord fell. And that sacrifice did not need the putting of hands. That God out of the two gods, did not need the putting of hands for a purpose. For a purpose. So individually, they had to bring the sin offering on which the gods were used. It was five, like we said. I mean, corporately, it was six. So what does this tell us? The sin offering that was offered in that one tapestry five and six, and brought together, knitted together, glued together. You see how it was glued together as we go into the study. That tapestry, that beautiful structure of the God's hair that covered was sufficient for all the sins that were committed during the whole year for the children of Israel. What does this tell us? It is the sacrifice of one person that is sufficient for all of us, that unites so one sin offering is sufficient for all the sin offerings that were offered. When the ketans, five of them and six of them, were brought together, there were 11 ketans, they all measured one. It was this oneness that was, this fabric that was knitted together. They covered all the sins of the children of Israel in that one ketan that covered in that one man's body of Jesus, because that's the ketan we're talking about. It is his body. Remember that the ketan was made of God's hair, and God's hair is a representation of the humanity of Jesus that covered that sanctuary. And that humanity, that's where our strength is, because hair is a representation of strength. And the glory of God is seen when God came and took upon human nature. When he was born in the manger, the angels came down and says, glory in the highest. When he wore that, that kitten, when he wore that God's hair, when he came down, they say glory in the highest. The highest revelation of God's glory. It's when he condescends, when he self-denies, when there's self-renunciation. And then he gives himself for the service of these people who are ungrateful as you and me are great, ungrateful. So in Hebrews, let's look at this Hebrews. This one sacrifice. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to read um, Hebrews chapter 10. We'll read verse 3 through to 7. Then we'll read 10 and then we'll go to Hebrews chapter 9. Listen to what it says about this one great sacrifice that is offered 
But in those sacrifices, those sacrifices that we read, there is a remembrance. Remember, a remembrance, a continual remembrance, a reminder of them being sinners. There is a remembrance again made of sins every year. So it was a constant reminder telling them you are sinners. Hebrews chapter, chapter 10, verse 4, it says, For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and the blood of goats. Remember the blood of the bull that was killed on the day of atonement for a bent offering and a sweet savor unto the Lord? And then there's this uh, blood of the goat. That it, it says it's not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering thou would not. It says, but a body thou hast prepared for me. So when Jesus Christ came, he became that living reality of all the sacrifices that were offered. That body, it was prepared, knitted together. Remember Mary? Remember the women that put together their the hairs and put them together and all this filled with the spirit. Remember Mary was, was told that a Holy Spirit shall come upon and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee and that holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. That God is going to create a new thing altogether. There's a new fabric that God interwoven in the structure of Jesus. That new thing is Jesus. The new creation is him. The new reality is in him. It is a body thou hast prepared for me. That body itself is the gospel. It's the basir. It's the gospel. His body is the gospel. It says, in bent offerings and sacrifice for, sacrifices for sin, thou would have no pleasure. No pleasure. Nothing pleases God as the one who is his own begotten. When he says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Three times he keeps on telling us the same testimony. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. There's no one who is well pleasing. There's no one who is a sweet savor unto the nostrils of God to come the off of God or to come the wrath of God as Jesus. We are not well pleasing in of ourselves before God. Quit this narcissism that we have and think, oh, you know, I'm so nice. I'm not this before God. God says, listen, there is only one who is well pleasing and that is my son. And without faith, you cannot please. And faith is in that one being. Your only argument you have is Jesus. He is the only one that is a sweet savor unto God. He is the only one that God has given us to calm the wrath of God that is going to come upon this world and destroy. It's not your church. It's not your elder. It's not all these activities that you get yourself involved into. It is Jesus. And unless you know Jesus, my friend, the wrath of God that is going to come upon this world will be on you. Jesus, you will see as we go into the study, how he took the wrath of God. He says, wherefore he has come into the world, he says, sacrifices, he says, sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure in. Hebrews chapter 10, the 7, he says, and then I said, then I said, I, lo, I come. It was a voluntary sacrifice. It says, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. To do thy will, O God. There's only one who has done the will of the Father. There's only one that trembled. There's only one that came fearing God and trembled in the wilderness. And was that fabric that trembled in the wilderness. And that's Jesus himself. He says, I come in a volume of the book. In a volume of the book, it is written of me. What do you think this book is about? It's about getting your validation, how nice you are and how you need to be happy and all this. This book is written of him. This book is about him. This book, the entire book is about him. The entire sanctuary, as you are seeing, we're talking about the fabrics that are put together and all this. All these fabrics are literally telling us about him. 
And I wish we can get fascinated with him before we get fascinated with ourselves. Before we get on the Azazel spirit of the devil who got fascinated with himself. The devil really got fascinated with himself. All the gifts that were given to him, all the carbonacles, the voices, the influence and all this, it got to his head. And sometimes our beauty, our influence, and all these other stuff, they get to us. Our money, our influence, and we think, oh, I am this special being. And we think we can actually take on God. We can actually be like Pharaoh and say, who is God? We can actually be like Nebuchadnezzar who said, is this not great Babylon that I have built? Not until God begins to humble us. Nebuchadnezzar was humbled. Insanity came upon him because he began to play the symphony of the devil. And humanity is moving. Look at, look at all the things that we watch. That's why humanity is moving. Humanity, the church, everybody else, the whole bunch moving in the same direction. Away from the Jesus of the Bible, let's create another Jesus. It says, I have come to do thy will, O God. There's only one that came to do the will of God. To obey the law completely. To live it out in that body of this, which was prepared it says in verse 10, it says, by the which we, sh we, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That one tapestry that united. The sanctification which is being talked about here, we are sanctified objectively. Our sanctification, us being sanctified, living all these good lives and doing all these things, it's because he is the one that is sanctified. There's objective sanctification, there's, there's a subjective sanctification that you go through in your own sphere. That's why the Bible talks about be ye holy as your father in heaven is holy. You cannot measure up with the holiness of Jesus. You, you just can't. That's an infinite quality of measurement of holiness. But God has called you in your own sphere. As Ronald, as, as Angela, has called you in your own sphere to do what you're required to do. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 9. We're now in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 20, verse 26. It says, For then shall he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Now, once, you remember we're talking about this one, this, this fabric that is brought together? It says, now once, in the end of the world, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. We're talking about the sacrifice of this one atoning sacrifice. The sacrifice of himself on the cross. It says in verse 20, 27, it says, <clears throat> And as it is appointed unto men to die once, and after which judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Because he's taking away their sins. When he comes, he's not coming to deal with things. Right now, when he is atoning in the most holy place, he is dealing with the sins of his sins, of his people. That's what he's doing. That's what he's interceding. He's interceding with his blood. His blood that cleanses from all sins. That's what he's doing for his people. When he comes, he knows who is his. And those that are not his, those that live outside of Jesus, they will be all melted. When Jesus comes, when we realize that he's the only one that is real, because everything else melts, all the buildings, the people, the whatever, everything that's not in him melts. When we realize he's the only one that is real, Jesus is so real, we are so unreal. That is so real that even the next person who's seated next to you is not as real as Jesus is real. And you realize, if you don't believe me, wait until when he comes a second time. You see how everything melts. And he's the only one that stands. Together with those that are in him, that lived in him and died in him. We can play all the games we want. Like, oh, I don't believe in Jesus. Yeah, you know, this book, I don't take it seriously, you know. We can play all the games. Oh, this book was just given to us by white people, you know. We can do that all we want. Like, go ahead, do that. But there's culpability. The fact that you are ignorant does not make you innocent. It doesn't make you innocent. And we need to look to the cross to see. 
That's how God deals with our ignorance. What happened to Jesus when the justice of God fell upon him? That's how God deals with our ignorance. <sighs> Culpability. Let's look at what it says. It says, Jesus in the loops. Now let's go back to our verses in uh, Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 26 verse 10. Let's pick it up. Remember this fabric has been put together. There's five of them and six of them. They've been knitted together. And in verse 10, we're told, it says, make 50. How many? 50 loops of the ages of the outer ketan in the first set, which is the five set. So you make 50 loops, 50 loops around it. These loops that are there to the ages of the outer of the second. And then 50 again on the ages of the outer of the second, uh, uh, of the second ketan set. So 50-50. So the first one has got 50 loops and the other one has got 50 loops. These 50 loops are the ones that are going to enhance the connection. 50. Now 50 in the Bible, very interesting. Let's read verse 11 before we talk about 50. It says in Exodus chapter 20, 26 verse 11, it says, and you shall make 50 bros, bro, brass or brosen hooks and put the hooks into the loops. So he, they make the loops and then they, they hook them together like this. It was going to form a strong bond. There's a reason why God has been specific in numbers and all this. Please listen. He says, 50 loops it shall make 50 brazen hooks or brass hooks and put the hooks into the loops and join the tent together so that it may be one unit. So the five and the six are joined together with these loops and then there are hooks that are made of brass to hook in so they join together with one unit. What does this mean? The word hooks used there, not loops, but hooks, it means to bend down or to stoop or to crouch down. So when the hook is made, it faces down like this. I hope I'm making this. It's, it's like a hook hooking a fish, catching a fish. So when this hook comes into, it goes inside and then it forms this. And then that's what puts together. But these hooks where 50, 50 is very significant. It's the word Pentecha or Pentecost. Pentecost, 50 hoops, 50, 50 hooks. Pentecost, what happened on Pentecost? The Spirit of God came and they were all in one what? One accord. There are two Pentecosts. Remember it's 50, 50, 100 together. The first Pentecost happened when the disciples uh, were in one accord when Jesus went and when he united under the headship of Jesus. They united under him and they received the Holy Spirit and they were all one fabric together with him. That's the 50 hooks. And then there's a second Pentecost which is coming. The first Pentecost happened, 50 Pentecost. The second Pentecost is coming. The latter rain is going to come. And God's people need to unite under him because when they united under him the first time, it was because he received the anointing as the high priest to do his work in the most holy place. And they received that anointing and they went out to preach the gospel. The second time when it happens is when God's people also unite under him during the day of atonement when he's been anointed not as a priest but as a king. He's wearing the garments of vengeance. There's judgment that's going to come upon this world. God's people need to unite under him. It was through that. Remember, the, it says, listen, the 50 hooks and the 50 brazen hooks and the loops that are joined together. It's talking about him gathering his people under him. Pentecost, he gathers his people under him. With that small group of people that prayed and agonized and, and they cried and they were, there was no longer who is the greatest among us. Oh, me, I'm this, me, I'm for who. And all that was gone. They cried out because they saw how offensive, they saw the sin that they had caused to him. They united and they cried out together and that unity formed under the headship of Jesus brought the latter in. 
the same fabric being formed together because of the one sacrifice of Jesus. Without the sacrifice of Jesus, that unity was not going to be there. Without the sacrifice of the gods, there was not going to be this fabric being put together. The gods needed to be sacrificed so that the hair is gotten together and fabrics are made and this thing is, is made for it to cover the sanctuary. I hope you're following me. So the, 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 brosen, old, the brosen hooks, remember the hooks were made out of bronze or they were made out of brass. Bronze is a picture of judgment. It was the judgment of God that fell upon him. When the judgment of God fell upon, it's a picture of God taking upon the wrath of, it's a picture of Jesus, who is God in essence, taking upon the judgment which is supposed to be ours upon himself in Gethsemane when he says, when he says in Gethsemane, he says, listen, this cup, Father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. But he drank that cup, and when he drank that cup, it was a picture of him taking upon the wrath of God that is in the seven bowls of the last plagues so that we do not participate in the destruction of the last plagues. Jesus took those. So the bronze is a picture of what it took for us to be joined together with him. It took the divine judgment to fail upon him. Those hooks, for us to be hooked to him, the divine judgment had to fail upon him. And when that divine judgment fell upon him, he says, there is no condemnation now to those that are in Christ Jesus. In him, in him, that one man who stands before God as our righteousness, there is no condemnation to those. Who shall condemn? It is Jesus that died. Nothing separates us from him. We are hooked. We are hooked with the greatest of all, the God, the greatest of all time, and that's Jesus. He hooks us because of his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary for us. That's the bronze picture, those bronze things that hook them together. Listen to what Job says in Job 6, verse 11. It says, what is my strength? You remember the hair is a representation of strength? What, what is my strength? It says, what is my strength that I should hope? What is my strength? I have no strength in me. Job says, I have no strength that I should hope. What is my end that I may prolong my life? Remember Job in the book of Psalms, we're told that, in the book of Psalms, we're clearly told that, make me to know my ending. God says that, he says, make me to know my ending. Make me to realize my ending so that I may know. I may know. I'm trying to find that verse. So that I show you the verse. Let me find that, that verse in the, in the Bible. Make me to know my ending. Make me to know my ending so that I may know. It's actually a song. Find that verse because I just don't want to say things without showing you from the scriptures. We'll find it. Don't worry. Teach me. To number, teach me to number my days. We'll find it in the book of Psalms. Psalms 90, it's Psalms 90, verse 12. The Bible says this, listen to what it says. In Psalms 90, verse 12, we have to talk about this. We just don't have to be so quick and we miss the whole point. In Psalms 90, verse 12, this was not planned. Psalms 90 verse 12, it says, listen. It says, let's start from verse 9. It says, all my days pass away in thy wrath, in the wrath of God. God consumes. It says, we spend years as a tale that is told. The days of our years is three scores and, and, and ten. And if by reason of strength, there may be 40 scores, or four scores, or 80, I mean. Yet in thy strength and thy labor and thy sorrow, it is soon cut off and fly away. That's how our days are before God. Soon cut off and fly away. 
And it says, listen to what it says. It says, who knows the power of thine anger? The anger when it comes, the anger of God. Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. It says, teach me to number my days. In verse 12 of Psalms 19, teach me to number my days. Hi. <laughs> teach me to number my days that I may apply that I may apply, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. God is asking us to know our days. Our days are as vanity before God. They just poof, disappear. And we think, oh, I know this because we've got all this wisdom. God says, listen, the psalm says, teach me to number my days. Here, listen to what Job says. What is my strength that I may hope, that I should have hope? We have no hope in of ourselves. It says, what is thine end that I should prolong my days? Verse 12, it says, is my strength the strength of rocks or of stones or of the carbonacles? Or is my strength of brass? And we're talking about the brass, the judgment. He bore the divine judgment in his body as represented by this brass reality. The brass is a representation of something that is being judged, something that is going to go through the fire. But it's also a representation of our <clears throat> pretension, of our hypocrisy, of our... Because brass mimics, looks like gold, but it's not gold. It looks brushish. It looks like it's gold, gold and around it, but it's not really gold. It's a picture of the fig, the fig tree that Jesus cursed. Because it only had uh, leaves without fruits. It's also a picture of uh, the fig leaves that Adam and Eve dressed in. That's a picture of the brass. It's something that is going to dry. It's not true. It's not original. It's pretense. It's not authentic. My strength says he bore the divine judgment. Listen to what it says in Zechariah chapter 13. In Zechariah chapter 13, this is what happened to Jesus. In Zechariah chapter 13, this, verse 7, it says, Awake, O my sword, against my servant, against the man that is my fellow. This is the sword of God coming upon him to bear the divine judgment. Says the Lord of hosts, Smelt the, se smelt, smelt the shepherd, and the sheep shall scatter. All those are going to scatter, and I will return mine and upon the little ones. So sin scatters. Us from God. And these God's hair tents, we see that God brings the, his children in that one sacrifice. He unites them in that one sacrifice through the God's hair. So when, when Solomon is looking at this woman, he says, Thine hair is as flock of gods from Gilead. It's reminding, it's a constant reminder of the God's sacrifice, the sin offering which we've been looking at throughout the whole study. Sin divides, but God comes in through the death of Jesus to unite through him taking upon the very penalty of death, the very payment that the Lord demanded of man. The Lord demanded eternal death, and Jesus comes and swallows death. He swallows the grave. He swallows everything else in victory. And we have faith in that one man who did that. That is why we do not fear death. We don't fear coronavirus. The church that fears coronavirus is not the church of God. Because it fears, because what you fear becomes your God, by the way. The Bible says fear God. And what we fear, our fears, we, we, we worship our fears these days. We bow to our fears. And because we bow to our fears, we don't see the power of God. God says, okay. You're afraid of them. You call them you call yourself grasshoppers and you worship them in this way. You're all going to die. Like you're all going to die. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh my God. Let's go ahead. That's another topic for another day. In Ephesians chapter, chapter, chapter 1, verse 9 through to 10, we're going to read these verses together. Listen to what it says. I think we're going to read up to, yeah, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. It says, Having made known unto us 
by the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he has purposed in him. There's a purpose. There are people who talk about a purpose-driven life. A purpose-driven life. They don't know that the purpose of humanity is in him. It's in that one sacrifice. God has purposed already in him, in himself. Ephesians chapter 1, this, 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 uh, 10, it says, And this is the dispensation of the fullness of time that he made, that he may gather together in one. In the dispensation of time, God is to gather together in one all things in Christ. So when you see the tapestry being put together or the 11 things being brought together, we're seeing that oneness that God uses to gather together in that one man, the new thing that God has created. Both which is in heaven and that which is on earth, even in him. Listen to what Paul is trying to say here. Because Paul is trying to tell us where reality is based. Heaven is based in Jesus. Heaven is the presence of Jesus. Listen to what uh, Ephesians chapter, chapter 2, verse 13, going down. I think we're going to read up to 22. Beautiful, beautiful structure of verses. Listen to what it says. But now, when? Now, in Christ Jesus, ye are somewhat, ye were sometimes far off, are made nigh by the blood, that blood, that reconciling blood, that purifying blood, that blood that pleaded, that eloquence of the blood, the one that is more eloquent than the blood of Abel, the one that is more eloquent, that is the blood that does what? Brings us together. It says you were far off, but now you're brought together, you're hooked together by the shedding of the blood of Christ, the anointed one. Verse 14, for he is our peace. Christians are not called upon to make peace with God. You cannot do that. You can never do that. Christians are called, are called upon to accept the one who is their peace with God. That is why it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Now being justified, when now, 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 in the hearing of the gospel, now being justified by faith. In that one man, we have peace with who? Peace with God. Listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14. It says, for he is our peace. Money is not your peace. Your wife, your girlfriend, whoever, they are not your peace. Our peace is Jesus. That word peace is the word Solomon, shalom, it's the female version. Solomon is the Solomon when he said Shulamite, not Shunamite, but Shulamite, he calls this woman Shulamite. Shulamite is the female version of Solomon, which is peace. For he is our peace. He has made both one hooked together, both one. And he has broken down the middle wall of petition between us. One, in that one being who is called Jesus. Some people, I don't know them, but they are so close to me. I've never met some of them, but they are so close to me through what? The gospel, oneness in Jesus. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity that was there, in his flesh, that tapestry that covered, that God's hair thing that covered, he abolished what? He abolished the enmity that was there. Even the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, abolished. For to make in himself of twine one new man. Even so, making peace. He's already done that. There's a reconciliation in the structure or the very body of Jesus. He's already done that. So making peace, that word peace is Solomon. That's the female version of Shulamite. So when we're talking about the songs of songs, we're really talking about God's heart relationship to his people. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16, it says, And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. One body by the cross. 
reconciling them, bringing them back together. And you see as we go into the Songs of Songs, breaking down the, the rest of the verses, this reconciliation that occurs because it's about that. It's about that one act of atonement, of reconciling and hooking to his people. It says, reconciling both into God in one body at the cross, having slain the enmity thereof. He slayed the enmity that was there. There was no sin in him. And come and came and preached what? He preached peace. He preached Solomon. He preached Jesus. To you that were far off and now have been brought, and those that were nigh. For through him, in him, through him, by him. The Bible just obsessed with this. In him, through him, by him. It says, through him, we both have access because of what he has done on the cross of Calvary. You see this double reality as we go into the study. Like there's, there's a double reality that has occurred because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. There's a water and there's, there's blood and then there's water reality. It says, who through we have both access by one spirit unto the Father. And now ye are no more strangers and foreigners. You are no more Naomi's that have come from Moab. But you've come in, your people are my people. What God would do to you would do also do unto me. Naomi picture that we looked at before. Ruth, I mean. Naomi and Ruth picture that we looked at before in these studies. It says, you're no longer strangers, but fellow citizens unto the sense of the household of God. We've been talking about this household that is covered. What covers us. It says, are built up the foundation, we are built up upon the foundations of the, of the apostles and the prophets. And then it says, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Amen? He's the chief cornerstone. It says, in whom, again, in whom, in him, through him, by him. It says, in whom all things, how many things? All things are built fitly, hooked, framed together. Growth unto a holy temple in the Lord. In whom, again it says, listen, it's, Paul is just obsessed with it. It says, in whom ye also are built together for habitation of God through the Spirit. The habitation of God through the Spirit. I'm going to read to you a quotation. Then I'll show you the double reality because it says that the sixth cater needed to be doubled over to make a closed door. Let's read a quotation from our high calling, page 48. Oh, this beautiful quotation, our high calling, page 48. It says, the humanity, that's what we've been talking about, that fabric. The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It's not your humanity or my humanity, but his humanity that was prepared in the woven by, in the fabric of the womb of Mary through the Holy Spirit, that holy thing that is called the Son of God. His humanity is everything for, to us. It is the golden chain. It is the what? The golden chain that binds our souls to Christ. And through Christ to God, his humanity is special unto us. And those that are, there's this double reality you see. Let's read the verse. Let's read the verse. In Exodus chapter 26 verse 9. Let's look at this double reality that is being talked about. Then we're going to end with the relics of a song. I love this song. Listen to, 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 to what it says in Exodus chapter 26, verse 9. It says, And thou shalt couple up the five. Remember, we've been talking about the five. The five, you shall couple them up or tie them together by themselves and six by themselves. And thou shalt double the sixth. So when you bring them together, the sixth one is going to be doubled or folded over at the front at the, at the forefront of the tabernacle or at the door of the tabernacle, at the closed door of the tabernacle. So there was going to be this folded reality to the sixth, the sixth ketan. Now six is the number of man. Six is the number of man. Six 
is the number of man. So when you divide six and double it, it's three, three, right? It forms that three reality. So when you see that double reality, why do they need to double the curtain like the sixth one? Man needs a double reality. Man needs a double blessing from God. Man needs that double reality to him. You see how it plays out. Even in the Songs of Songs, if you go back and look at that study that we did, I am black but calmly, she says, I am black. That's the one reality. In of myself, I am a sinner. I am black. I deserve death. A sinner who's been saved knows that. They don't claim to be righteous. They know I am black. Oh, wretched men that I am who shall deliver me from this body of sin. It is tainted. My righteousness is as filthy rags. They know that I am black. But we are quick to say I am calmly. I am black as the tents of Kida, the black tents. But I am calmly as the Catons of Solomon. Do you know what was beneath that tent, that 11 Caton? There was another one that was inside, and that's the Caton of Solomon reality. That's the fabric of the nature of Jesus. The one that had the golden hooks, not the, but the very divine nature of Jesus. So what are we seeing? This double reality. There's this double reality that is there. God has given us double. Even when Jesus Christ is dying on the cross of Calvary, there are two streams that are coming from him. Two streams. When he's hanged on the cross, there's blood and water that comes out. That's the double reality. That's what man needs. When he's dying as a man, he's folded. There's a double reality that comes from him. Listen to this great song. I love this song. It's called Rock of Ages, Cleft of Me. Listen to the relics. I'm going to read the relics because sometimes we read these songs, but we don't really understand the, the weightiness of the song. Listen to this. It says, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood, that's the double reality. The water and the blood, where is this water and blood coming from? It's coming from the one that hangs on the cross. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure, saving me from its guilty and power. Not the labor of my hands, not the things that I can do, not my own righteousness. I don't want to be found in my own righteousness. Paul says that. But I want to be found in another man's. I am black. Not the labor of my hands because they're being judged by the sun. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. The law demands the labor of the hands of the infinite one. What you do with your hands, the works that you produce, they cannot recommend you before God. So he says, not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. The Lord demands an infinite life. Jesus came in Daniel chapter 9 to 24. We are told that he came to bring in everlasting righteousness. Righteousness that lasts forever without beginning, without end. This one that intercedes. He's infinite in his quality. His life is infinite. The law was a witness to his life, and the law says, yeah, I agree. It's infinite. It's perfect. Even his death was a perfect death because the law demanded the death of the man, and God offered the sufferings of a God, the death of a God. It says, not in, it says, not the labor of my hand can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite nor could my tears forever flow? Oh, could never, never the tears that we may cry could never, forever, even if they were to flow forever, they could never Sin erase. Thine alone must save. You alone, O oh God, must save. By thy grace I must be saved. 
If I'm not saved by grace, I, I, I am doomed. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked came I to thee to dress, I am naked. I come to you to dress me up helpless, helpless. Looking to thee for grace. Foul, feel vow. It says, Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. If he, if, if he does not wash us with his blood and the water that comes from his side, there is death that comes. Wash me, Savior, or I die. While I draw this fleeting, fleeting breath. We think we're something. It's the fleeting breath. Today we're here. It's vapor. It ev evaporates from our reality. It says, while I draw this fleeting breath, when mine eyes are closed in death, when I die, when my eyes are closed in death, when I die, I shall soar to woes unknown to see thee on thy judgment throne. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. That's our refuge. That's our argument. That's our message. That's our warning to everyone around. There's a rock 